Okay, I think I think it's recording now. So I'm used to good. working with um, Google Hangouts. So <laughs> it's a little different with each platform, I guess. Uh, so I thought we would just start um, maybe with introductions. I know some of you guys are probably in different user groups together, and I'm fairly new to the community. So um, I guess uh, I'll go ahead and get started. So I'm Jill Clavin, and I'm the Director of User Services at Pueblo City County Library. Um, we hosted the COHA conference last year, so if any of you guys were at that, you might recognize me from there. Um, my main jobs are I oversee collection development and technical services, um, which includes overseeing COHA, and then I also work with our circulation department a lot. So just really any issues that come up with users and access to information. So, um, Heather, do you want to go? Sure. I'm Heather Hernandez. I'm the Technical Services Librarian at the Research Center at San Francisco Maritime National Historical Park. And we're a museum collection, library, archives, and objects. And our uh, library collections team is very small, myself, a reference librarian and a library technician. So I thought I would join the user services SIG to uh, just frankly learn more and um, try to uh, bring things from my fellow library team members and keep an eye on things to bring back to them too. Great, thank you. Um, Barbara, do you want to go? Hi, I'm Barbara Johnson at Bedford Public Library, Texas. I'm the technical services manager, systems administrator, do all COHA things. Um, we're a single site library, so um, sometimes what we need is different than the larger libraries or consortiums. Uh, and I'm just here to learn whatever I can. Hi, I'm Kim Robbins. I work in circulation at the Middlesex Community College Libraries in Massachusetts. We have been on COHA for about two years now. We started, uh, we were part of um, a new consortium that we founded, the HELM Consortium, which is the Higher Education Libraries of Massachusetts. And so um, I, I belong to the Access Services Working Group for that. Um, for Helm, and so I thought it'd be great to get involved uh, in Koha US user services too. Okay, great. Uh, Jason? I'm Jason Robb. Um, I'm the Seek and Find Coordinator here at the Southeast Kansas Library System. Um, we run a consortium of Koha libraries. We have 47, 46 public libraries and one academic library in our consortium. Um, so I do like training. I, I'm the go between between my libraries and Bywater. Um, right now, I've been working on, in regards to user services, I, I've been developing some video trainings for our patrons that my libraries can share out. So um, I do a little bit of everything in Koha that I can. Um, I'm also <laughs> the Koha US secretary. So I've been um, trying to keep up with all the SIGs just so that I can help out with Zoom and that kind of thing. So, um, and I also post the recordings. And if, so if you guys have any co US related questions, I'm happy to answer those as well. Okay, great. And you know, I was supposed to really get this group up and running. I think it was like the week that everything shut down in the middle of March. And then I just also shut down myself. So <laughs> totally that's why fine. it's a little pushed back. <laughs> but thanks for getting this all set up, Jason. <laughs> And we appreciate you taking the lead, so. <laughs> okay, uh, Valerie? Hi, yes, um, my name is Valerie Darling and I am an intern at the Southwest Research um, Institute here in San Antonio. Um, and my boss is the mainly the one who deals with COHA, but I'm learning cataloging and all that. So I just found out about these, these Zoom meetings. So I'm trying to get to all of them to see what I can learn. Okay, great. 
And then um, Janice went through the chat, so I'm not sure if her audio is working or not. Um, but so she's from the Mississippi Department of Archives. I'm here. History. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Janice Tate. I'm with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. I am, we've been on COA since 2011. We started out when it was 3.2. Um, and I am uh, the database administrator. I had no library experience. And so I was kind of thrown in, <laughs> uh, especially when my boss retired in 2013. And so I manage all things COA. So I work with catalogers, I work with the circulation people. Uh, I do a little bit of everything and by water is always helpful. I always have them on speed dial. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Um, Marie, we're just doing introductions. Okay, I'm not sure. Uh, well, so I thought we would just kind of get started. Um, I have a couple of things on the agenda, and um, if anyone else has anything they want to add in. Um, I guess my first thing, just with everything going on, I just wanted to see how everyone's kind of managing with COVID and what what the status of your libraries are and just kind of how you're using COHA to manage, um, you know, anything. So. I was telling Heather before everyone got on, we're, we're getting close to phase four of reopening. So we're, we've been doing curbside since early May. Um, and then just a couple weeks ago, we started doing computer reservations um, and then browsing sessions. Um, so we were planning to start phase four next Monday with um, more people in the building and our meeting rooms being reopened, but uh, Colorado's one of the 41 states that are seeing the increase in cases. So I think we're, we're gonna push that back a couple of weeks, but I was curious um, with COHA, when we went to the curbside pickups, we switched all of our current pickup locations to say curbside pickup. And then that kind of created a lot of issues for staff, um, just with having to transit items back and forth between locations. So. I was wondering if you guys did something similar. Um, I don't think I did that the right way. So. <laughs> um, well, I can well, jump in we, if, Oh, go ahead, Janice. Um, well, we didn't necessarily, we didn't have to turn off anything. Um, we don't circulate, well, we circulate, but nothing leaves our building. Everything is check out and you return before you leave at the end of the day. So when we shut down, we didn't have to do any changes because we just was closed and we didn't have any patrons or anything coming in. We just reopened on July 7th and we're going appointments um, only. So everything has been running smooth. We just, we were in that last upgrade to 1911. And so we have, we, maybe hit like one quirk, but it was dealing with the limitations of how many you can place, items you can place hold on. But other than that, we haven't run into any problems. Okay. Yeah, we um, we kind of, we changed some of our loan rules and holds. Um, I think it was kind of a free for all there for a month or two. We I feel like we were kind of letting our users have anything they wanted. And <laughs> I mean, we were, eliminating some fines and we stopped our collections activity. It was just, it kind of felt like there were no rules for a while. <laughs> we actually suspended, um, so we, I think we have 14 libraries in our consortium and we stopped, because the state stopped the delivery system. And so we stopped lending to other libraries. In theory, we could, um, you know, capture holds for our own patrons. But the problem that we run into is we have two campuses. And if the student is associated with one campus and not the other one, we can't capture holds 
like the holds won't, we can't place a hold on an item that belongs on the other campus. So we were, so we're going to be doing those manually and we're going to start up really soon with the curbside and make appointments for the pickup. We think on Wednesdays, like a limited time frame on Wednesdays. So I think that all the staff will be placing the holds. We're asking the patrons to get in touch with us and fill out a form and everything like that. And that's how we're going to handle it in the beginning. Most of our classes for the fall have switched, I'd say about 98% have switched to online. So we'll still be doing a lot of virtual um, services for them. And we've already walked through both of our campus libraries and set it up with the facilities folks, you know, like blocked off certain computers, taken away all sorts of chairs. And we're going to have people, um, you know, I believe check in at the desk with us. And, and I, I don't know whether we're going to be escorting them to certain workstations or not. I'm not quite sure how that's going to work yet, but that's, we've certainly been discussing it. So that's basically what we're doing right now. Okay. Yeah, we're, uh, we're doing something similar. We're, we have security. Um, they're running our contact tracing that we have to do. And um, then they, they just kind of escort our patrons up to the computers and then Many of our staff gather around and watch the watch the patron at the computer, and it's really awkward. And then, about three of staff members clean the computer station when they leave. It's very strange. <laughs> One other thing we did I forgot to mention we actually had facilities build these big. Um, we got they got plexiglass, and we built these big shields that we put all around the circulation desk and the reference desk. So, we'll see. So as, as an added protection, I guess. And we have to wear masks, of course. Right. Is anyone else having a similar experience? I mean, what you, you mentioned changing settings for pickup locations and stuff. We had to do a lot of changes and go off for that. Um, when it first started, we, um, we saw a courier going. Um, so we were still encouraging people to fill holds and send holds and stuff. We're, we're across the 15 county area. So, so um, we, we have, we still have messes we're cleaning up from that. Um, we're back. Some of my libraries, all my libraries opened and then some of them have reclosed again. Um, and so as we were like dropping off, we, we changed the settings so that no non-local holds could be placed um, so that only uh, holds would be pulled from individual locations. Um, and then as we open back up, we flip that. So um, holds could be placed, but then if the library is closed, um, we turn them off again, um, prevented holds. So that, that's been the, the biggest mess and struggle I've had so far, I think. And I think I have like, a, I'm afraid to look. I'm, I'm pretty sure I have a lot of things in transit that aren't really in transit, but the transfer is never completed. Um, so that's one of those big cleanup jobs that I'm still kind of just holding out on because I'm like you, um, not sure <laughs> how we're going. I'm sure we're one of those 41 states as well. Um, and we're pretty dependent on the courier. That's our litmus test. So if the courier stops running again, then we shut down again. At Bedford, we, um, we're a single site location. We have a pickup window. So instead of doing curbside, um, having that window has been fabulous because people aren't having to make an appointment to pick up their holds, they just come. And, but we did have to figure out how to um, create that location. And we, we went through so many different scenarios and, and I kept track of all the loan rule changes and the you know how many holds and how many days for this and whatnot and and then it would change again and then it would change again <laughs> and then it would change again you know um and then we also have an automated sorter so one of our issues was with holds if you run them through the sorter then the patron gets notified immediately that their hold is ready but we're quarantining for 72 hours so it was that whole thing to try and figure out. And what we ended up doing, and I, it, it was working for us, what we ended up doing was we created our pickup window 
as a separate location, like if it was a branch. And we're checking everything in through the sorter and the sorter is our Bedford branch. But all the holds we're forcing in the catalog to be placed for the pickup window. So it comes through the sorter and gets checked in. And if it has a hold, um, we print the slip, but the notice doesn't go out because it's not at its pickup location yet. And then it goes and sits in quarantine for 72 hours. And when it comes out of quarantine, we check it in at a station specifically with the pickup window location, and then they get their notice. Um, and that took a lot of figuring out because we never did transfers because we're a single <laughs> site. So just the whole concept, you know, you realize what it is, but still just the ins and outs of making it work. And I, I think we've got it down now and staff is, you know, remembering that they've got to do two things in order to make sure that patron gets notified. And then during all of that, our um, text messages stopped working and we had to get that figured out. We got on some kind of block list or something. And so, you know, it's even just the main things you're trying to figure out, then something else <laughs> comes in and uh, makes it even more challenging, so. Well, it sounds like you guys did it in a really smart way. We actually turned off all of our notifications when we went to curbside because, just because we thought it was gonna be really confusing. And so we didn't think of doing something like, you know, you just mentioned because um, we're also quarantining returns um, for 72 hours. So if <clears throat> there were holds on those items, you know, we're, we're kind of moving them or we're moving signs from room to room where we have the items quarantined. And then we were having staff just call patrons um, manually to let them know when their holds were ready. And then they were scheduling the curbside pickup. And I don't think staff really cared for that too much because that just was a huge drain on their time. But our director really thought it would be good to have that personal contact, just kind of checking in with the patrons like, hey, you know, we're still here for you. And, um, but now as we're getting ready to go to phase four, I think we're, we're finally ready to turn our notifications on again. And then we're gonna switch all of our curbside locations back to their regular locations. But send on the notices, we're gonna still have language saying, we still will do curbside, just go ahead and call us. And so I think we're finally getting that squared away. Does anyone else have any COVID-related topics <laughs> or well, experiences we're, um, that they want to share? We're still completely closed. Uh, one thing we've been looking at doing is still trying to uh, get more records in for digital resources on, say, things we have that are also available in the Internet Archive, because being a history collection, our collection is older, and there's a lot that's out there available for free so get a lot of that on and then let me put a link in the chat i've been starting a list and i'm going to be adding to it there's only two items on it right now of online uh, sea shanties and we're uh, my park we're going to try to do a virtual shanty thing and so we thought that using the list feature for some online resources could make sort of, you know, a kind of a playlist for people. You have to kind of go into the record to get the click to the online resource. But we thought this could be a fun way of trying to feature some digital items to support the virtual experience we're trying to give people right now. Oh, cool. Oh, Caroline, did you want to introduce yourself? We went through that at the beginning and then we're just talking about COVID stuff. Hi. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was just lurking in the background, so <laughs> I don't really have anything to contribute. Um, so I'm Caroline, I'm in Montreal and um, I work for Inlibro, which is a support company. And uh, I work with Marilus actually, and um, she told me that you guys were talking about reopening. So I was curious as to what people are doing. Um, 
for reopening the libraries, you know, with the quarantine and the disinfecting and everything. So yeah, I was just listening. Yeah, I think um, I think the standard um, that I've been hearing is 72 hours at most libraries for quarantining. Um, I know libraries in Colorado, the directors kind of they meet weekly, so they thought we should all do that just so that it's consistent and we're not having customers. Because initially we were thinking I'm only quarantining for 48 hours and we thought, well, better safe than sorry. And then, of course, research is coming out that, you know, even 72 hours might not be um, totally necessary, but I think we're going to keep it like that for a while. We're, we're actually looking at a more extended, uh, perhaps even seven days. Um, but again, we're uh, research only on site. Research appointments are necessary. When we do reopen, we have no reopening date. Um, also, because of our materials being special collections, and researchers usually always are working with a mixed group of uh, library materials, all kinds of library materials, archival materials. They're not completely usually plain paper based. There can be plastics and housing and coated papers and and being a special collection we thought well we we may be able to do something like a complete seven day quarantine for you know to be very very safe and very secure um but again we're not reopened yet so uh that's still up in the air we're also looking at disinfecting our surfaces with at least 70 percent isopropyl alcohol because we can't have any residues on the tables or surfaces or book trucks where our collection materials are going to be because of the residues that a lot of wipes leave behind and also we don't want people using gloves with the library materials they're often very fragile very delicate and when people need their tactile sensation in their fingers so there's going to be no hand sanitizers but it's going to be required that people must wash their hands thoroughly before using materials and we're still working out procedures for how the staff are going to be using the materials to um, taking things like when the staff researches with materials at their desk those materials are going to have to be quarantined before going back on the shelf and working those procedures out too right now yeah that's a lot to think about <laughs> And we've we've just been doing a 72 hour quarantine as well. Um, my problem is I have two schools of thought <laughs> with my libraries. Uh, some of them don't want to touch the items at all at, for 72 hours, um, and some of them want to check it in and keep track of it. So the ones that check it in immediately, we do have it set up in Koha where it'll um, change the shelf location to quarantined, uh, and then it, it falls off after 72 hours. The ones that wait. Um, it's still going to put that on the, there <laughs> and then it'll fall off 72 hours later. So um, that was one of those messy battles that I had to fight. Um, <laughs> but it, it works okay. We did find a bug with it where like you have to check in the item twice if a transfer is involved. Otherwise, it doesn't apply the status. It says it does, but then it takes it right back off. Um, so... I've got a bug ticket out on that somewhere. Um, but yeah, we've been, we've also been following the Realm project. Uh, it looks like they just posted some new stuff today. So I'll put that link in the chat as well. Um, but 72 hours is what we've been going with. So Jason, and that, when you use the no one's gotten sick yet. Sorry. <laughs> when you use the quarantine status, is that um, kind of a status that's not allowing like, it to be a late check-in because what we're doing, we're not using that and we're just backdating everything three days. So do you not have to backdate then? The libraries that wait either have to backdate or um, write off fines as they check them in. The ones that check them in 
it, it just works as normal. Um, I've okay. been encouraging most libraries to just check that little forgive overdue fines box whenever <laughs> at this point. Um, fines I've left entirely in their hands. Like each library has to handle that themselves. I'm not digging into that at all. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it, it doesn't, all it really does is um, gives it a different shelf location for three days. Mechanically, it doesn't do any more than that. Um, people can still place holds, holds can still be filled, they can still get checked out. Uh, it reverts the shelf location if they get checked out or put in transit. So it's it's not a perfect solution and it'd be nice to have a perfect solution in Koha for quarantining, um, but I'm, that's probably gonna take some development. But it does work for, for what it is. Yeah, I don't think anyone really envisioned this coming up, so. <laughs> I think it's pretty good that they have it. <laughs> um, so has everybody done the newest upgrade to 1911? And do you feel like the new features? So, um, you know, that, that really changed our claims return process, um, which, you know, like I said, we're fairly new to Koha. We've only been on it for about a year and a half. And we were on Circe Symphony before where the claims return process was really, really easy. Um, so when we made the switch, I think staff had a difficult time um, with claims returned, but I feel like it's a lot easier with the upgrade. So I guess I was wondering if you all had thought that as well. Full confession, we didn't, we haven't turned on claims returned yet. <laughs> it's not something that um, we ever use. We've been on Koha since 2008. Um, so we've been without any sort of claims return functionality at least that long. And none of my other, okay. none of my migration libraries really asked for it. So I decided um, and convinced our team to go with it that we would let that cook a little longer because I know there are some other bugs in the work as far as keeping it clean. Um, we'll let that cook a little longer before we turn it on, so. Okay. We haven't, we haven't turned it on yet. We have an access services meeting on Wednesday and um, they'll be showing it to the different libraries and then we'll have to have a vote on whether to turn it on. So we're still waiting. <laughs> we had it in our old system, we were on um, Millennium before and we used, to, we used to use it. Some of the other libraries in our new group um, we all came from different um, library consortiums, so everybody has is coming from a different place. So I think some libraries didn't use it at all before. So we'll just have to see uh, how it plays out, I guess. We tested it out and the CERC staff didn't like the way it worked, so I've disabled it. Um, I think we treat I think we define claims return differently in our policies. Basically, you get one claims return per lifetime. So you claim you return it and we'll say, okay, if we can't find this one, um, then you get a freebie and we'll, you know, write that off. But you can't keep coming back and claiming return. And I know that from they're attending different user groups and things. Other libraries define it differently. And anyway, when we tried it, they, they were just like, this is too confusing. And so for, for them, they, they just didn't like it. Wow, we let customers have 10 claims returned in their lifetime, which is like mind blowing that we let them have that many. I'm gonna let them know that you guys only allow one. <laughs> Uh, um, and then I guess, is anyone using the new book clubs feature? No, that's our, our feature. <laughs> we um, sponsored the development of club holds. Okay. Um, and we're not currently using it. I just saw earlier today that the, so the way we wanted to use it was you have a club for every author, right? So. Um, we have a James Patterson Club, and then anybody in our consortium can sign up for the James Patterson Club. Um, when a new James Patterson book comes in, we put a hold on for all those patrons. Um, since we're in a consortium, we want those holds to be picked up at the patrons' home libraries. 
uh, but currently it sets the pickup location to the staff members library. So if there's like 200 patrons on that list, all those holds are going to come to me if I, <laughs> I place the hold. <laughs> um, so I uh, had a bug out and it just got pushed to 2011, I think, um, that allows it to default to the patrons home library. So next upgrade, we'll be able to finally use that. But we were excited about it and I can talk about it more if you want since <laughs> we wrote up the spec and stuff. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we're excited to use it. Um, we didn't envision, I guess, doing a club for each author. We, we're much smaller. We only have seven branches. So, you know, we have a couple book clubs at each of our locations. Um, so I think we were planning to use it that way. Um, so we've turned it on. I'm not sure if anyone's used it yet. I know we just sent the tutorial out to staff in the last few days. So we tested it out just a little bit, and we weren't thinking specifically of authors um, either quite. We were thinking of, like I do the romance collection, so I was thinking, well, I could have a contemporary romance club and a historical romance club. And I was testing it out, and I somehow I was testing it out on the live side rather than the um, test server. And I later found I had three people enroll. <laughs> In the clubs during the time I'm testing it out and I don't even have anything set up yet but so apparently people will find it I guess if you put that out there um, and then I guess has anyone also worked with the multiple guarantors feature That's one I'm a little iffy about. Um, that just, I think that gets, you know, I think having the capability to add them if they ask for it is good. I don't think that's something we're planning to promote in any way. I think that could just be kind of messy. So um, we did we did turn that on, but I don't I think we'll use it on a really limited basis. My only interaction with that was having to fix broken reports. <laughs> Because I had reports like my patron purge report links in guarantors and apparently it was linking in everybody. <laughs> so um, I had to fix that. But I, yeah, we did the same thing. I mean, I told my libraries that you could do that now. Um, it's, it's out there, but it's not a, a big deal either way. It's not something we push. A lot of my libraries don't even link the accounts. So mm -hmm. the, one, the ones that do may or may not, not use it, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so those were kind of just the main things I wanted to talk about for our first meeting. So did anyone else have anything they wanna talk about as it relates to user services? I know it sounds like a a lot of you guys are from research institutes, so you probably have some different things that, you know, as a public librarian, I have no clue about, so. <laughs> well, we, we do have, uh, we do have some differences, but uh, it's, we, I would say that with our collection, we grapple with a lot of the things that y'all grapple with, but just in a really, really tiny way. Like we had one of our staff members have a claims returned once. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, our, our reference librarian deals with those mostly through, you know, she, you, the, he would get the look over the glasses like really and and <laughs> so uh, since only staff are eligible to check out our materials we deal with a lot of things in a very tiny way but a lot of the features that get developed and pushed forward for larger collections are often very very useful for us but just in very tiny ways like the, um, I'm listening to what you all are doing about quarantine and quarantine locations very carefully because if we do implement something like a seven day quarantine, we're going to be needing to track materials very carefully. 
Right. Yeah. And so with that, you know, we, we found it just most useful to use our meeting room space for those and just um, have tables set up and we just move the dates, you know, we, we just put the end date and then the out date. So we're not having to move those items um, more than once. Yeah, I was, I was envisioning some sort of sign that would say something like, you know, don't shelve before X date, you know, rather than the date it went into quarantine, maybe signs indicating when it's eligible to come out of quarantine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, I think what they do, uh, um, I don't go to the office much, I'm at home, <laughs> but I think we've got cards with um, days of the week on it, and they, like, the day that it comes off, so, like, the Thursday cart, they're going to take everything off the Thursday cart, or the table, I know they've got a meeting room set up that way, too. Um, I Apparently, that works. I don't know. <laughs> I don't have a, a visual on most of what's going on in my libraries, but, um, yeah, that's how we do it, I'm pretty sure. We just, we, I have a, I just made a quick sign and I, and, and we don't have a lot of material coming back and we have book drops that we've set up um, on campus that the patrons can access because the libraries themselves are locked. And when we, and on Wednesdays, a few of us go in for a few hours and we grab, we empty the book drops, put them on a book cart and it'll have the date um, we got it and the date when we can check it in basically three days later. So we're checking in after we do the quarantine. Um, but so I've got both dates on, on the, on the cart. And again, we don't have a lot of material like the public libraries, so it's, it really hasn't been that bad. Are any of you guys doing a mail delivery um, service kind of similar to homebound service for your patrons? We didn't do um, mail, but for a period of time, we did home delivery to mostly to um, senior uh, the senior population here, and that was a super hit with those people. They were so appreciative. Yeah, we ended up adding an extra location in Koha for that. Um, we already have an existing homebound service, but we thought we would offer a service um, just for customers who maybe didn't feel comfortable even coming and doing curbside. Um, so that's been really popular. Unfortunately, it's very expensive. And I think it's about the same 30 patrons that are continuing <laughs> to use the service. And they're not mailing the items back. Um, so they're returning them. So they feel comfortable enough to return items at the library. <laughs> I think they really like that, getting them in the mail. So I think that's something we're going to be pulling back on because it's, it's really expensive. <laughs> But I think we just kind of, when everything started, we're like, let's give the customers, you know, everything we can think of. And um, now we're kind of just reevaluating some of those things. Um, this is Janice. As I was, well, as Heather was saying, we're an arc of a library also. And so most of our collections, let's say maybe, may have five boxes, but within those five boxes, it may be six or seven folders. And so if a patron checks out, you know, folder one and folder two, those are the only two things that really need to be, you know, quarantined. So we kind of been grappling with how, what's the best way to do it. Um, I, they were talking about in our stacks area, there's, uh, we have file cabinets and it's enough of them where we can have one day a week per file cabinet. And so they were discussing using those file cabinets to put those items and then just go with, if it was checked out today, we know that come Thursday it'll be ready for to be put back into rotation. Um, we also was having the problems also with the gloves and the sanitizer and all that because of most of our fresh collections. Um, we have been trying to scan 
as much fragile things to make them digital as we could, but we we had to let go of some staff. So we're kind of just, you know, taking it one day at a time of trying to get back into things. But we are doing appointments only, as I said, and our times are from 9 to 11, 11.30 to 1.30, and then 2 to 4. And in between those times is when the staff will clean and wipe down. Um, we have a media room where you have the microfilm and the scan pros. We took out machines in between. Um, so, so far, so good. Um, we have the stations and the, the, per, uh, the glass up, the plastic in between. So, and the staff is wearing masks and gloves. Um, the, the public that comes in, we're telling them they need a mask. If they don't have one, we have some. Um, but other than that, like I said, we haven't ran into any problems so far. That's so good to hear, Janice. I, I really love the idea with the, the file cabinet for the folders because we have a, we have a few spare filing cabinets. Yeah. Does anyone else want to share what they're kind of doing? Um, I know everybody's in different phases right now. It's, uh, it's kind of interesting to hear everyone's experiences because we're all scattered throughout the country and, you know, every state is in a different boat at this point. I know we just had our governor mandate masks um, a couple days ago, you know, in all public buildings. So, um, yeah, I kind of feel like Colorado is going a little bit backwards now. And I know that Texas and I think California might be <laughs> even more so. Yeah, yeah, we, um, we were, we were feeling very, very, very cautious. And, but then the, with the infection rates, going up in in California and everything I think we're we're feeling good about our caution and our slowness um, and uh, Janice reminded me that we're also trying to think of ways to increase our digitization for people so that they wouldn't even have to come in and uh, trying to figure out how to perhaps offer more of those services given the staffing level and and then access to the equipment and the timing of staff going in and then of course sanitizing the equipment between uses we're open at a 25 percent level um, and i think that equates to about 32 people in the building so we've got a staff member sometimes a volunteer out front that's you know counting the ins and outs and um, we really haven't had too many problems with um, masks we were envisioning people you know getting really put put out um, but most everybody has come with one we do have them and you know the few that have been you know really you can tell from their reaction they really don't want to take a mask um, you know we just were like mask you know we have them and they'll they'll take it they really don't want it but <laughs> they'll take it we do sometimes see them in the stacks and they've pulled it down but it's that's really the minority i mean really people are coming in and they have their masks and i think the people that are coming are just really appreciative that we're actually you know open partially we've got we we socially distanced our computers and we cut them down to, we, I think we've got nine computers available for 90 minute um, time slots, one time a day. Um, and then we're doing thing, you know, we're doing all the virtual story times and, and the different things like that. We do have a, um, a weekly craft that our children's librarian puts together and they put some supplies in a, like a paper lunch sack and um, patrons register for the craft, it's family craft night. And we post the uh, instructions on whatever the craft is. And then they um, can pick up their bag at the 
uh, pickup window. And so I think this week she was doing Chia Pets. And so she, it's like, they're doing a, a blob. It's not really a pet. It's just kind of a round blob and they're using pantyhose and soil and grass seeds. And that's their craft, you know, so that people are being really, um, really creative to try and still make us, you know, relevant and fun. And Yeah, we're going through a similar situation with our virtual programs and it just makes me thankful that I've never had to come up with programs. That's never been in my job description. <laughs> that is so not what I could do. <laughs> I'm more about numbers, circulation. <laughs> I have a question for folks. I've noticed some libraries have put out videos, you know, hey, um, as they were reopening, these are the services we're offering. Have any of you folks been doing that? Because we were thinking about that. Um, doing something like that because things are going to change. So we want to give people a heads up. You know, you won't be sitting right next to somebody. So I was just wondering if anybody else did anything like that. We haven't uh, thought of doing anything like that, but I wanted to chime in to say that I really appreciated our public library that I use as a patron, all the materials and information they put out because it is terribly unfamiliar knowing where do I go for my curbside pickup how do I, you know, what, how is my whole different? How's my library account different? So I think those types of videos and social media posts are fantastic as a user. We didn't do a video, but we've got Facebook posts and things with what you can do and what you can't. We're calling it a grab and go 30 minute um, experience. And there's no seating except at the computers. We removed all of the chairs and large tables. All of our um, smaller areas, like we have a, a reading room that has magazines and newspapers, all of the study rooms, um, all of those are closed um, because they're smaller spaces. And um, so basically it's, you know, we're here, but um, come, you know, quickly get your items, check out and go on your way. It's kind of the theme. Yeah, we didn't create a video either. I really like that idea. <laughs> um, we did um, just like our Facebook page and um, updates on our website, um, kind of a press release just to let customers know what to expect. Um, I think the video is a really great idea. Yeah. It was the I, the one that I really liked. It was a it was a Texas library. Jason, I don't I don't know if you would because um, I think it was a oh maybe it was a video that I I watched um, maybe one of the Bywater webinars or something like that. And somebody from Texas actually had. Um, put up a, you know, welcome back type of video explaining all that the director had explained all the different changes. So it was really kind of neat. So I, I sent it out to my colleagues. Um, I'm not sure if uh, it was a video or not, but I know Cedar Park, Texas, um, when Bywater had a town hall meeting, uh, I think her name is Catherine Ingram from Cedar Park. She um, had a lot of good ideas and she shared a lot of information. And they had, um, you know, a, just a sheet of what you can and what you can't do. And we used theirs and then based, you know, kind of used their format and, and just kind of presented it the way they did because they had really summed it up nicely. I do see, here's a, a Bywater post. It looks like maybe um, McKinney did one on reopening as well. Yeah, that might be the library that I'm thinking of. Have, on Not, a different topic, have, has, have they decided they're making the COHA conference completely virtual or are they still deciding on that? Yeah, so the um, in-person conference this year for COHA US is going to be all online. Um, okay. Same dates. As far as we know, we may, we're kind of um, waiting to see how many proposals we get. We may cut it down. Um, but at this point, it's the same, same, same week in September we're planning on doing that. 
and then um, next year we we've, we've got McKinney um, marked down as our our site for 2021. Oh, okay. So oh good. That's the plan at this point, at least. Yeah, because that would not be fair to them. <laughs> oh no, they they won the vote. <laughs> we talked it over with them, and they're okay with it. So we're we're gonna try that. Um, and hopefully next year we will have to have it, get to have her in person. Um, and then I know the international conference is still being held in New Zealand, but um, they're also doing a virtual component because uh, most, well, we can't go up for sure. <laughs> but I don't think most people are traveling. Um, I don't. I don't have any other updates on that. But uh, yeah, as far as I know, for the the international one, that's still the same date range as well. Yeah, I was at the general meeting last week, and they were saying that um, they're just redoing the schedule, but it's going to be the same, uh, the same dates, and uh, they're going to have an in-person thing for New Zealanders, but for the rest of us, it's just going to be online. Okay. Well, it's almost the end of the hour. I was going to say it's almost two o'clock, but that's just for my time. So <laughs> does anyone else have anything else? Has anyone noticed like slowness in the staff client as compared to before the upgrade? Like any new slowness? No one's had complaints about that. No, okay. I feel like ours has always been really slow. <laughs> it's the well, same. <laughs> I, I get complaints about searching all the time, which is normal because we've got like 700,000 items. And if you put a three or an and or an A in the search bar, it takes, it times out. Usually it's a proxy error. Um, but recently I've been getting more like, it took, it's taking forever to save my record. It's taking forever to click around to load a record. I don't know. Um, I was trying to figure out if maybe that's something I did <laughs> or if it's something I need to have to look at because um, I do have an excessive amount of jQuery. So I might pull that out and see if it's still slow. But the problem with slowness complaints is I can never replicate them. Like every once in a while, it'll slow down for me, but that could be your internet. That could be your Wi-Fi going out. Um, so. I don't know. It just seems like I've had an increased number since the upgrade, but that could just be the upgrade effect as well. Um, I like to blame things on the upgrade, but people also, whenever change happens, they're like, it must have been the upgrade because it was like that before. Um, so I just wondered, I thought I'd ask here. Okay, well, um, so this is going to be the regular time. Um, we chose Monday. I just feel like a lot of the groups meet on like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So hopefully Monday afternoons are good for everybody. So I'll send out a reminder for next month's meeting. Um, and then hopefully we'll have even more people on the call. So I guess I will stop recording. Um, and then you'll have that, Jason. Yeah, so that'll go to um, our account and I'll get it downloaded and then uploaded to the Koha US YouTube page. I'll make a new playlist for this special interest group and I'll get those links.